begin with this image, but I start with it because it very graphically illustrates the point that really the Earth is mostly water. But it's, uh, the, the cast I would like to give on this theme is, is biological, because not only do the oceans cover 70% of the planet Earth and thereby have an enormous effect on our climate, they also harbor most of the biological diversity on Earth as well. Life began in the sea, and even now, almost all the major groups of animals and plants are either only found in the sea or um, are found primarily in the sea. Now, we tend to be less familiar with this diversity because we're terrestrial organisms, so we know all about birds and butterflies and oak trees. We know a lot less about most marine organisms, except for perhaps uh, those we eat. But the reason I show it is because just on this plate of food is an enormous amount of biological diversity. Uh, the various organisms here, we tend to call them all shellfish and think of them as one thing. Those are shrimp, obviously, sea urchins, oysters, mussels. Well, these organisms all, uh, their ancestors originated somewhere between 600 million years ago and a billion years ago. And so they're very, very distinctive genetically. And it's for this reason that the, the sea really harbors so much diversity. It, be, it began so long ago and has been evolving ever since. And to give you a very graphic feeling of how diverse this assemblage is, in case you don't just believe me, here's a sea urchin. And we as people are much more closely related to sea urchins than the sea urchins are related to the mollusks, the clams on this table. So there's a huge amount of genetic diversity sitting in the sea. Now, of course, there are lots of things that we don't eat. For example, if you dive on a coral reef and you bring up a piece of coral from about 200 feet and turn it over, the undersurface is covered with various marine organisms, things like uh, sponges here, bryozoans, commonly called moss animals, ascidian, all sorts of groups that you have had probably no experience with whatsoever. And so these groups, together the ones we do eat, uh, comprise a huge reservoir of biological diversity, which is of potential use to us in various ways. I mean, one of the reasons, actually, we don't eat these organisms is they're full of all sorts of really obnoxious compounds which have potentially uh, enormous importance for us uh, in terms of pharmaceuticals. Now, the fact that we don't, we, are, we ourselves not marine organisms means that we don't really know that much still about many of the basic building blocks of marine biodiversity, so that every time we go out into the oceans and sample the oceans, we find new, new species, often not just new species, but entire new groups of organisms. And, and as a consequence, we're really just beginning to, to ex examine the tip of the iceberg in terms of our understanding of marine biodiversity. This is true not only of the things that, for example, live in the deep sea or underneath that surface of coral that I showed you. Most of those organisms are almost certainly undescribed. It's particularly true of all the things that are too small to see at all. Uh, for example, the bacteria. Many of the bacteria in the ocean can't be grown and cultured by conventional microbiological techniques, and so it's only recently with the developments uh, associated with uh, biotechnology that we've actually been able to study these organisms genetically. And in many cases, we actually only know them simply by their DNA sequences that we pick up in the sea. We actually don't know what they are physically. But that despite the fact that we perhaps uh, under, have recognized only 1% or fewer of the bacteria in the world's oceans, they've already turned out to be incredibly important to us. For example, in the lab of Brad Tebow at SIO, he's been working on the bacteria that are useful in uh, turning toxic metals into non-toxic forms. And just uh, by sampling bacteria right off the pier at uh, here at Scripps, he's found organisms that are capable, in this case, for example, of taking water that's contaminated by chromium and uh, through various physiological processes turn it into a non-toxic form. And just in the last year alone, he's discovered 20 different previously unknown bacteria that have potentially uh, enormous use to us in, uh, in terms of detoxifying metal contaminated sites in San Diego Bay and elsewhere. Unfortunately, much of this diversity 
that we know so little about is uh, disappearing faster than we can study it. And this next series of slides comes from uh, Mia Tegner, also at SIO, and her work on abalones. Here you see a picture of the white abalone. This is a species that was only described in 1940. That's fairly recently for a big, uh, potentially commercially important species. Uh, but unfortunately, uh, its recent description has been followed by its recent demise. Uh, it lives in quite deep water, so initially it wasn't fished. It's not normally found below, uh, above about 75 feet in depth. But as other abalones were uh, progressively fished in shallower waters, people came to, uh, to, to fishing of the white abalone. And as you can see from this chart, uh, once the fishery began in the 1970s, uh, essentially it was over nine years later. 95% of the stock was taken within nine years and then was followed by the complete collapse of this fishery. And this may be one of the, this may be the first marine invertebrate uh, to go extinct from overfishing. Now people didn't used to think that marine organisms could go extinct. The ocean is so big and there's so many of them, uh, it was deemed essentially impossible to fish something to extinction. But it's turned out that many marine organisms are in fact very vulnerable uh, to overfishing and uh, extinction because of their reproductive biology. Here you see a picture of a, an abalone. It's a close-up, that's the shell. These are the little holes that are characteristic of abalone. Uh, shells, and coming out like smoke is in fact uh, the sperm from a male abalone. Now some abalones are males and some are females, and that they're rather like people. Uh, most, many marine organisms actually are hermaphrodites, but not abalones. And um, the sperm and eggs uh, are released into the water column, and that is where fertilization takes place. Now, sperm are very enthusiastic swimmers, but they're very small, and they can only go a certain distance, usually not farther than a couple of meters before they run out of steam. And uh, as a consequence, once things get rare in the ocean, this is true of many, many marine organisms, they're too far apart, uh, really farther apart than a, a couple of yards or meters, then essentially reproduction is impossible and no future abalones are produced. And that's what's happening with the white abalone. They've been fished to the point that surviving adults are so far apart that they, they can't mate with each other. Now to give you a sense of some of the scale of overfishing, show you this picture of um, uh, what looks like a fairly desolate landscape. It's, it is perhaps desolate, but it's also worth pointing out that the, the primary physical features are all clamshells. Now some of the work being done by uh, Jeremy Jackson and Paul Dayton have showed that, that over the course of human occupation, we've totally transformed marine ecosystems by this massive fishing effort. And ecosystems essentially bear no resemblance uh, to uh, what they used to be because we've removed so many of the players. So far I've shown you mainly pictures of clams and uh, abalones, but of course fish themselves can also be overfished. This slide comes uh, uh, from Enrique Sala, who was just recently hired by SAO as a conservation biologist. He works on groupers, and groupers have a very interesting form of reproduction as well, in that they gather together at very traditional sites in which to mate just uh, a few times a year. And these uh, mating sites, of course, are well known to fishermen who are invariably successful fishermen, are very good biologists. And unfortunately, as fish stocks have become more and more reduced, fishermen have had to turn to these mating aggregations to keep their families fed. And in Belize, for example, along the entire coast of Belize, there are only about six, there, in 1970, there were about six traditional spawning sites. And uh, as of the last uh, year in which they were, last year in which they were studied, only two, two of those six, in other words, 30% of them, 33% have already disappeared. And in the Bahamas, where spawning aggregations used to consist of literally hundreds of thousands of groupers, recent surveys suggest that the largest spawning aggregations uh, now only have a few thousand individuals. And so even for fishes, uh, it's quite possible to bring them to the brink of extinction because of the certain very vulnerable phases in their life history typically associated with their reproduction.
So as a consequence of all this activity, we have a lot of marine environments which are essentially ghost towns. This slide comes from Paul Dayton, and uh, it's a beautiful slide. It's a lovely picture of a kelp forest, but many of the most uh, important, or traditionally most important, ecological players in this setting are essentially missing. And Paul illustrates this really nicely in the following slide. This is the kelps and the community of fishes that are supposed to be associated with them. But in fact, the kelp forests of today are literally ghost towns with most of these uh, large vertebrates. Essentially, they're, if they're not actually extinct, they're ecologically extinct. Now, overfishing is obviously catastrophic for the organisms that are fish themselves, but it can ha also have enormous, very widespread uh, effects on communities at large. And the best example I know of for that comes from reefs uh, in the Caribbean, which I've studied for the last 25 years. This is a picture of what reefs used to look like on the north coast of Jamaica. They used to, as not too surprisingly, since they're called coral reefs, uh, they used to be uh, covered with corals. When we were there, we, we studied the corals and we didn't pay too much attention to the fact that as you can see in this picture, there are not very many fishes and that's because subsistence fishing in Jamaica due to poverty has essentially removed everything longer than a couple of inches in length. But the corals seemed fine and so we didn't worry about it too much. And then in 1983, there was an enormously uh, important epidemic disease that swept through the entire Caribbean and affected only one species, this sea urchin shown here, diadema. This was really an extraordinary epidemic and actually it still keeps me awake at night when I think of it in terms of what might happen to human beings if something like this happened to us because the, the disease arrived at any particular site and within four days, 98% of all these urchins were dead. So these are urchins that used to be so common that there were about 20 of them per square meter or per square yard. And within four days, you could swim for hours and not find a single living sea urchin. And this disease spread uh, over the course of a year throughout the entire Western Atlantic, essentially eliminating this sea urchin ecologically from all Caribbean reefs. Now the problem was, is that this, in the absence of most fish, this was the primary consumer of seaweeds. Now seaweeds compete with corals, and they grow much faster than corals, and the reason corals succeed is because other things eat seaweeds. Uh, people, uh, most organisms prefer to eat uh, plants than rock, which is what most corals are made out of. As a consequence, when you eliminate all, all of the herbivores, either through overfishing, the combined effects of overfishing and disease, what you wind up is a situation like this, where you can see all this material here. This is all seaweeds overgrowing these corals. And by uh, the middle 1990s, reefs that used to be 50% uh, uh, covered by corals now have less than 5% living coral cover. They're essentially algal reefs. They're collapsing. They're losing all their three-dimensional structure. And they're losing the ability to support the enormous diversity that coral reefs uh, traditionally have supported. Now, so far I've been talking about primarily about fishing and the effects of fishing, but there are lots of other threats to uh, marine ecosystems and organisms that I'd like to briefly mention as well. Here is a slide that comes from Lisa Levin at SIO. She works on salt marshes, uh, both the threats to salt marshes and ways of restoring them, uh, including locally here in San Diego County. And this picture shows what happens when a salt marsh is attack attacked by an invading species that is not native to the region. The organism responsible for the collapse of this margin of the, of the salt marsh is a tiny little shrimp-like organism called an isopod, and it burrows into uh, the sides of the marsh and causes it to collapse. And uh, this organism is not native to San Diego, but it's invaded both uh, San Diego Bay and San Francisco Bay, and is causing quite a lot of loss to natural uh, salt marsh habitat. Some of you may have read in the papers that uh, they've also recently found in San Diego the so-called killer alga of the Mediterranean. This is actually, any of you who have ever dived in the Mediterranean know this is a potentially very serious threat because many parts of the Mediterranean are essentially completely overgrown by this toxic alga that nothing uh, wants to eat. And so the ecosystems of the Mediterranean have been transformed by this invasive alien species. And the same thing could happen here.
in addition to invasive species, we are increasingly facing in the ocean the problem of disease. Again, a slide from Mia Tegner showing a healthy uh, black abalone and one subject to the something called withering syndrome. Uh, between this disease and the effects of fishing directly, this abalone may also join the white abalone on a list of endangered species. Now, in this case, it's believed that the spread of this disease has been uh, facilitated by global uh, warming. And this also appears to be the case in many marine diseases. Here again, one of my favorite organisms, a coral. And it's suffering from uh, something called yellow band disease. Now, I should point out, uh, in the context of what I said earlier about not really understanding biodiversity, is we have absolutely no idea what the organism is that causes yellow band disease. In fact, we still don't know what the organism was that killed 98% of all those sea urchins back in 1983 either. There's enormous ignorance in terms of the pathogens that are responsible. But Regardless of whether we know them or what they are or not, we do know they're causing a huge amount of damage. These diseases of corals can kill corals at the rate of a centimeter a month and sometimes even one to two centimeters a day. And this is catastrophic for corals because corals uh, secrete a calcium carbonate skeleton. They grow very slowly, usually only a centimeter a year. And so that means that this coral, which is probably 50 or so years old could be dead in a matter of years. And, and many corals, larger corals, which are centuries old, can be killed in the course of a decade. Now, climate change uh, may be involved in uh, the spread and uh, seriousness of many diseases. It also uh, potentially plays a catastrophic uh, role in the phenomenon which was alluded to before called coral bleaching. I don't know how many of you have read about coral bleaching, but all reef building corals uh, are able to build reefs because they exist in a, an a obligatory symbiosis with this organism here. It's a kind of dinoflagellate. It's actually related to the things that cause red tides. But these are very helpful, useful organisms because they allow corals to grow very rapidly. And they're really responsible for the enormous productivity that is associated with coral reef environments. Now, this is a wonderful example of how the tools of modern molecular genetics have transformed our understanding of diversity in the sea. Uh, because uh, in this case, it used to be thought that all these uh, little uh, single cells of algae were the same species, despite the fact that they lived in corals and giant clams and sea anemones and a variety of other different kinds of marine invertebrates, because they all look the same. We, all, we assume they were the same. But it turns out if you look at the DNA of these algae, they, in, uh, they encompass an enormous amount of genetic diversity. So that some of these algae are diff as different from each other genetically as, say, rats and cows are different genetically. This has turned out to be of more than academic interest because these different algae have different abilities to with withstand stress. Here's a picture of a coral suffering from coral bleaching. Essentially what happens is when seawater gets too warm, it basically cooks the algae and it stops photosynthesizing and the symbiosis breaks down. And so here you see a coral. This part still has its normal complement of symbiotic algae, but all these white areas, they're still alive but uh, they're lacking their symbionts. And corals in this state, if they don't get symbiosis restored with their algae, will die within the course of a couple of months. And in fact, in 1998, during the major El Nino event that we had, seawater temperatures in the Indian Ocean were extremely high for a prolonged period of time. And about 90% of the corals on most Indian Ocean reefs died in 1998 due to uh, coral bleaching. Now, the reason this, I show this particular slide is you see here that this part of the coral appears to be unaffected. And this is uh, because it's uh, occupied by algae that are genetically resistant to the effects of high temperature. And thus, by understanding the diversity that exists, which was unex completely unexpected, even a decade ago, we had no idea that this diversity existed. By understanding it, we can perhaps figure out genetically what allows these algae to persist in high temperatures, and perhaps use that knowledge to protect reefs of the future against the effects of global warming. Of course, 
uh, corals and abalones aren't the only things affected by diseases. Sometimes uh, people are affected by diseases in ways that relate quite intimately to the ocean itself. This is a picture of a patient uh, suffering from cholera. Cholera is not very common here in San Diego County, but where I lived for many years, it was a major killer throughout Central America and also throughout all of the old world as well in tropical uh, environments. And the interesting thing about cholera is that it's caused by a bacterium, Vibrio cholerae, which in fact is transported uh, in marine, uh, in, in ocean waters, near shore ocean waters. And it, once again, it's believed that the increase in the occurrence of cholera epidemics is, is maybe partially linked uh, to global warming. But there's another very uh, telling a part of this cholera story vis-a-vis uh, -vis the uh, importance of scientific knowledge because it turns out that uh, thanks to the work of uh, various people at SIO, to Bartlett, Brukasam, and, uh, and their colleagues around the country, that cholera doesn't just float around loose uh, in seawater. It actually attaches to tiny little shrimp-like organisms, copepods, and other things. And so much of the transport of the cholera um, pathogen occurs thanks to its being concentrated in these, in these small planktonic organisms. And this simple biological discovery has enormous implications for human health because cholera primarily affects countries with very limited uh, financial resources in terms of attacking medical problems. But because the cholera bacteria are not free uh, but attached to something bigger, you can do something very simple to uh, decontaminate uh, water that has cholera bacteria in it. And for example, in India, women, as you know, wear uh, beautiful silk sari. Silk is a very finely woven material. It would never be enough to filter bacteria out if they were loose, but because we now know that the, the bacteria are attached to small shrimp, women in India can now simply filter their uh, water for consumption through the, their saris, an incredibly cost-effective low-tech solution to cholera that stems from a, a fundamental biological discovery about the natural history of how this disease is transmitted. The sea also offers a number of promises to some of the diseases that we uh, most fear, uh, cancer among them. This shows a picture of a team of SIO scientists from the Center for Marine Biotechnology and Biomedicine about to begin a dive in Palau. As I mentioned at the beginning of this talk, uh, many marine organisms uh, use nasty chemicals to defend themselves against potential predators. And people, in turn, can use those chemicals to help fight disease. And here you see them, as I say, in Palau. They bring up a number of organisms that are likely, because they're uh, defended chemically, to contain pharmaceutically interesting and useful compounds. They bring them up, identify them, sort them, and finally take them to the laboratory to analyze them chemically. Turns out that somewhere between two-thirds and three-quarters of all the potentially useful anti-cancer compounds being screened by the National Cancer Institute come from marine organisms. So the potential importance of marine organisms for fighting the war against cancer uh, is enormous. I also like this slide because it shows, here it shows uh, Professor Faulkner of SIO, and he's joined by a student from Palau who came here to SIO to learn the chemical techniques and then bring them back to his home country where he could apply them there. Of course, you don't have to go all the way to Palau to find uh, useful marine organisms. As I mentioned, some of the chemical, uh, the metal detoxifying bacteria are uh, found right here, but also anti-cancer compounds as well. Uh, Margot Hood uh, has recently been working with uh, this organism, Bugula neritina. Uh, it's a found on the SIO pier and in slightly deeper water. And it turns, to, turns out that it contains a compound called bryostatin, which is now in phase two uh, clinical trials uh, against a variety of uh, uh, very serious cancers. And so even right here, right on our own pier, we have organisms that, if we know, en know enough to look for them, uh, have the potential to solve some of our most serious health problems. I'd like to add, however, though, that it, you don't necessarily find solutions to problems 
uh, in, in the most direct possible fashion. The case of the, of the sponges and the bryozoans, we knew that these organisms were chemically defended and they were fair, therefore likely candidates for anti-cancer compounds. But sometimes medical discoveries come from amazingly unexpected sources. And this slide comes from Vic Vacke of SIO, who primarily studies the, the basic biology of uh, the the fertiliz fertilization in marine invertebrates, how eggs and sperm fuse and fertilization takes place. This work was not motivated by anything medical. It was motivated by a basic interest in fertilization biology itself. However, it turns out, this is a picture of a sea urchin egg covered by sea urchin sperm. Uh, sea urchin eggs are coated with jelly, and there's a gene that is expressed in sea urchin sperm that uh, is responsible for the sperm sticking to the eggs and fusing to the eggs and is, is essential for uh, fertilization to take place. Now, as I mentioned at the beginning, sea urchins are, are somewhat close relatives in the sea, and it turns out that there's a gene in humans uh, which, can, when mutated, causes polycystic kidney disease. This is one of the most common genetic uh, illnesses in people. And uh, until recently, we had no good model system for understanding it, and we didn't really, we knew a mutation was responsible, but uh, we didn't know what the mutation did. Now, it turned out when Vic uh, took his sequences for the gene that's responsible for sticking echinoderm sperm to echinoderm eggs and put them uh, in a computer program to see what sequences in other systems uh, they resembled, it turns out, uh, the closest match was to the gene that is responsible when mutated to, call it, to causing polycystic kidney disease. And so now much of uh, Dr. Vacquet's work is uh, funded by the National Institutes of Health with the idea of using this uh, gene in sea urchins to understand an important medical problem in people. A completely unexpected consequence, needless to say, of his original interest in fertilization. I'd like to actually conclude with a few general, general comments about biodiversity. This is a picture of a coral reef, my favorite environment. There are no really pristine marine environments left on the planet, but this comes pretty close, at least in shallow water, because it occurs off of the coast of Australia, and Australia takes care of its reefs pretty well. But most marine environments are in much worse shape than this, and even this one is, is threatened. And it seems clear as we think about the, the way the oceans have changed over the last 30 years, in, really in my professional lifetime uh, and also before, that understanding and conserving marine biodiversity is one of the most important challenges that we face in the next century. Now this is a, a great scientific challenge, uh, not just a political challenge because we, so know, we know so little about uh, how marine, what even marine organisms are, much less how they interact with each other, and the, the complexity of these interactions, which in biological systems are even, they're even more complex than physical systems. And people tend to call coral reefs the rainforests of the sea. I actually like to think of rainforests as the coral reefs of the land. But in any case, the, um, the, the problem with, with coral reefs is much deeper scientifically than the problem with rainforests in the sense that with rainforests we can track them by satellites and we know what is responsible for the loss of rainforests. It's, it's uh, basically cutting down trees. However, the things that are killing coral reefs are much less clear and less well understood and so basic science, scientific investigation is an absolutely critical part of solving this challenge that we face in terms of keeping our oceans healthy. So I thank you very much for your interest in science at SIO and uh, encourage you to continue to hear more about it. Thank you.